thank you very much uh, for being with us. Can you tell us something about yourself? You are now a professor in Yeah, London. I'm now a professor at, uh, at Queen Square University College London, uh, where I've been for the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, before that, I was at the NIH in the States, at, in Washington, and before that at the Mayo Clinic, and you know, several places before that too. So it's but originally you're British? I'm originally from Burnley in northern England. Yeah. yeah. And, and what brought you to uh, genetics? Uh, actually, well, I always wanted to work on the brain and uh, ne neurological diseases. And I did my degree in biochemistry and then I did a PhD in pharmacology. And I, yeah, start... I, I saw that you worked it with uh, Merton Sandler. Yes, exactly. Who was a good friend uh, from the old days. Exactly. I, I did my PhD. He was my second supervisor of my PhD. So I'd on, on uh, amines in the brain. Right. So, um, yes, I did, he was my second supervisor. My first supervisor was Harry Bradford. And I, so I worked on neurochemistry and pharmacology. Uh, but in 1983, um, Gusella published his Huntington's Linkage. And I suddenly had a, almost a, well, shall I say here in Israel, road to Damascus um, uh, experience reading that paper and seeing... Um, you know, what a wonderful way that was of approaching neurological diseases where we could previously only look at brain tissue. And I was very fortunate that, uh, although I was a biochemist and pharmacologist, at that time I was at, in St. Mary's Hospital, and everyone else in the department was a geneticist. And so I learned from them and gradually switched my approach from pharmacology and biochemistry to genetics at that time. And you're happy with it? Oh, it's been a great, I love my job. It's a great job. And uh, yes, and of course it's, I've been very fortunate to be a geneticist at this time uh, when the human genome is sequenced and all these technologies allow us to look at the whole genome at the same time. And it's a fantastic time to be a geneticist. But I'm a, a clinician. And they wonder, I mean, so you're collecting pieces of data here and there. Uh, you mentioned uh, Muzella, and now it's, what, 30 years uh, since we've, they've identified the gene. Um, you know, uh, 25 years since you have contributed, uh, or 20 years uh, since you've contributed to the identification of uh, Alzheimer genes. Um, uh, 15 years since we know more about Parkinson's disease. None of this has uh, materialized or um, led to uh, interventions which are important. I agree, and I think that uh, certainly we have, have all underestimated the, uh, the time it takes from developing, well, from identification of a gene, that's the, the time it takes then to understand what the function of that gene and the other genes involved in the disease is. That has taken a long time, in fact, is not complete because we don't know the function of the amyloid gene really, it's even now, we don't really know the function. And then again, how long it takes from, develop, from moving from that understanding to treatment undoubtedly has taken a lot longer than we expected. I, I think that you know, everybody would, would have said that things would have moved quicker, but um, you know, that's the way it is. It's been more difficult than we expected for sure. So what are the stumbling blocks? I mean, why, why is it that uh, understanding, uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, is also APOE, which uh, in many people's mind, in my mind, may be more important than APP uh, or, or uh, presenial in genes. And, and yet it doesn't, we don't understand uh, really what uh, APOE is doing and, and whether APOE4 is bad or is APOE3 good? We don't really uh, differentiate between these two. So, so and, and not for the lack of trying. So what's the next step? I mean, how are we going to uh, translate these important, uh, very interesting findings that uh, you have contributed to so much, so much into clinical practice? Well, let's, let's divide that answer into two bits. I'll start by saying how long do I think it will be before our understanding of amyloid might lead to amyloid therapies? I'll start by trying to answer that question, although it's not easy. Uh, and then I'll talk about APOE a little bit as well. 
So I think with regard to amyloid, even we are just beginning to have drugs now which hit the amyloid target. We are just, I think we've had two drugs, perhaps three drugs, which have hit the target, two of which failed for reasons we can do, talk about some more, uh, uh, and semigazistat and bapimuzumab, and then one sol solinuzumab, which may be showing the first signs of efficacy. I'm optimistic about that. I mean, it's uh, an optimism, it's not a certainty. Uh, but I think that uh, with that approach and with the inhibition of amyloid production through base inhibitors, we might, we might be within five years of having a therapy. I mean, of course, it's not a promise, but I, I, I'm optimistic about that. Now, with regard to APOE, you're undoubtedly right that APOE is the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Absolutely, certainly, and probably contributes about half of the known risk of disease on its own. Um, with all of the other genes, amyloid, presenilins, and all of the other genes we've identified recently through genome-wide association studies, undoubtedly it's the biggest risk factor. APOE biology is particularly complicated, um, and that's undoubtedly been a problem. And uh, of course, you've got good groups here. In fact, I think the best group in the, in the world actually is here in Israel with Danny Michelson. And I think that that is his his work is amongst the best in the world on uh, on APOE. But it is a very difficult problem to study APOE in the brain because its interactions are so complicated, and that's been part of the problem. And so people have not had a good, uh, if you like, handle to do good experiments on APOE. However, out of the, these recent genetic studies, we have been identifying many other components of risk. And many of these components are also, like APOE, related to cholesterol metabolism. And I would say that, these, that knowing many points of this uh, cholesterol, if I'll call it a cholesterol problem, of a brain cholesterol problem, will now start to have impact on trying to develop therapies which impact on that. And I agree with you, your implicit criticism, which is that it hasn't been studied enough. I agree with that implicit criticism. It has not been studied enough. And I, I think that there, sh there should be therapeutic possibilities in that area. So thank you. So, so in, your to in your talk at uh, the David Prize uh, ceremony, you, you mentioned uh, or you uh, reiterated the division of the genetic contributions uh, to Mendelian gene, uh, diseases on the one hand, where the, a gene has a major contribution, uh, and on the opposite side are the minor contributions and, and those that are in between. So where does Alzheimer's disease uh, belong there? Which side of the spectrum? Well, most Alzheimer's disease uh, is contributed by, m so the very few gene, very sorry, very few cases, as you know, uh, early onset disease have simple mutations in either amyloid and, and presenilin. Uh, those are very rare. Uh, I'm guessing that most neurologists don't have any patients in that category here in Israel. Um, of course, there will be a few. Most Alzheimer's cases will have uh, late onset disease where APOE is a, risk fa is a risk factor, and then these other genes, I can list a few of them, ABCA7, CR1, and clustrin, and now, as we found last year, TREM2, these are, uh, are contributors to this late onset, um, less clearly genetic form of the disease. So, so would you say that uh, those diseases were on the far, far uh, left side, uh, those associated with APP or presenilin mutations, and uh, those with minor contributions of many genes are the same disease? The same processes are happening. How do you know? The well, because of the pathology, I would say. Oh, the, end, the end result the is end the same. The end result, this is the same. And as we follow, but now as we start to see, uh, for example, amyloid imaging, uh, we start to see that the sequence of events is broadly the same. But you're right, there must be... So this is something that worries me as well, 
And I think that, um, you know, in the amyloid and presenilin mutations, we understand pretty much why the process starts. And um, what we don't know in late onset disease is why the process starts. And I feel that the um, gap in our knowledge relates to what I said before, which is that we don't really know what the function of the amyloid gene is and, what, and if amyloid itself has a function. And what worries me is that uh, amyloid deposition in the typical form of the disease is a response to an, another process. And then after that, it becomes part of the problem. So I wonder, for example, if amyloid is deposited in response to damage, and that when that response becomes too great, then it becomes part of the problem, almost like an inflammatory process. Amyloid is almost a product of an inf possibly inflammatory process. And so I think you're right, it is important it's very important to understand what initiates the problem in typical disease. So, so I give uh, the uh, analogy to uh, uh, hepatic cirrhosis. And of course, patients who have uh, liver cirrhosis um, have the same pathology, have the same uh, clinical phenotype, have the same biomarkers, whether the cirrhosis results from abuse of alcohol or from uh, hepatitis, after hepatitis, or whatever. And so, uh, so is it right to look at, uh, at Alzheimer's disease as a disease? Because you cannot do the same thing with, with uh, liver cirrhosis. So you have to understand, in my mind, the pathogenesis in order to define a disease. Yes, I have not, never thought about cirrhosis, and I would give you a, a competing analogy which is of hypercholesterolemia, where some people have genetic hypercholesterolemia and other people have uh, dietary-induced hypercholesterolemia, but probably most people have a mixture of, a mixture of, co of reasons for their hypercholesterolemia. And we all, in fact, I have some here, take statins to reduce cholesterol even though the causes of the hypercholesterolemia are different. So that's the, but if you were, if the criticism is we need to know what the cause of amyloid deposition is in, in typical late onset Alzheimer's disease, I absolutely accept that that is an, a, um, a huge piece of the jigsaw we are missing. I absolutely agree with you if that's your criticism. In, in the case of uh, hypercholesterolemia, which is a, a, a good example, uh, I think we, are, we, we, are, we know, at least we think we know, that cholesterol is an important pa uh, partner in the crime. We, we are not, I am not convinced that we know that this is true for, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, and uh, it's just possible that uh, amyloid is a marker of the disease rather than an important player or initiator. In your talk, uh, so you are a Baptist. You no, well, you know, you, uh, you know there was this uh, citation. Uh, you know, of course, uh, that I'm always portrayed as a Baptist. If in fact that if there was the citation report by uh, in uh, in one of the journals uh, about of Alzheimer's disease about four years ago, and actually I've worked far more on tau, far more, far more. But you're right that I think that that uh, our data and other people's data suggests that amyloid is the initiator and tau is downstream of amyloid. So in that respect, I accept the, the, the um, criticism of being a Baptist. So you believe that uh, beta amyloid is the initiator of the process, although uh, at least in the hippocampus or in the medial term temporal lobe, uh, you see uh, the initial process uh, as a tau hyperphosphorylation before you, you see any evidence of uh, amyloid? Yes, I mean, that's true. But, for example, if you... Uh, the, the experiment... I'll, I'll make two, two arguments with you. The first is there are other diseases, um, and the, the, the most famous one has the unfortunate name British dementia, 
where you get amyloid deposition, uh, and in the amyloid in that disease, the amyloid is a brie, and you get tam tangles subsequent to that amyloid deposition. And you do also in some prion families get prion amyloid deposited, and tau is clearly secondary to that. So I would say, but, but not in the same places. They are not deposited in the same places. That's another important uh, issue that I don't it, think has been resolved. It has not been resolved. It has not been resolved. I would say uh, that the places where the tangles, that uh, in general, tangles are deposited in neurons which project to amyloid-rich regions. But you're right that that relationship is not worked out. And the recent data, especially from for example, the, the Yucca, the Tolnay, and the Gerda labs um, shows that tangle deposition, once initiated, can spread, you know, spread on its own with that, you know, through a, what people call a prion-like mechanism. So yeah. it can become self-propagating, undoubtedly. Which I call the prionization of neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, yeah. I don't like using the word prion, I have to say, but, but uh, certainly there is that propagation pro process. Possibly. So, so the question, so another important question, and I'm sure you, you, you thought about it, so maybe you can tell us. So if there is this neurodegenerative process uh, which involves amyloid or tau or, or synuclein, what makes some cells being yeah. more sensitive to the abnormalities, to the genetic abnormalities, that uh, they will deposit it first and others uh, will be immune to this at all, uh, altogether? I don't know. I mean, that's a straightforward. Uh, understanding selective vulnerability is something that is so far, so far been beyond all, all, you know, that's clearly a problem. I will say that the very first place that you get amyloid deposition in the projections of the entorhinal cortex, those are the cells which m produce in the CNS, as far as we can tell, the most amyloid. So there is a component of the selection which seems to be related to, you know, APP, APP expression. But I accept that that is not that is definitely not the whole story. So, so in uh, these uh, genetic cases, which are so important in understanding the uh, pathogenesis of the disease, why does it take in, the, let's say, uh, the British uh, dementia that you have mentioned? or the APP mut other APP mutation carriers, why does it take decades for the disease to start? What, uh, what goes wrong? Does it ne do we need to get a second hit in order to develop a disease, or is it the natural course of the disorder? I don't, well, I don't know. Again, of course, I have to say I don't know. You know, the second hit does not, I like, Conceptually, I like the idea of a second hit, um, but it doesn't really fit uh, because, for example, all the cases with the first mutation we found, the APP717 mutation, they all get sick between 51 and 59 years. They all get sick, and actually most of the variability in that age at onset is down to APOE. So if you know their mutation and their APOE status, you can forecast within two years when they are going to get sick, really. And that is not easily consistent with a kind of second hit because you would expect a second hit to be reasonably random over an age range, and that isn't the case. So although I like the idea of a second hit, it doesn't really fit with the, right. the data. So, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the reason for the age is that it takes some time for the disease to get going. So, you know, I mentioned that the age of onset is 55. When we look carefully, we can see that they start to, to lose, for example, some of their hippocampus when they're in, in about 50, 51. And when we look at their amyloid scans, we now see that they are starting to deposit amyloid at about age 42 or 43. So part of the age uh, problem, the age conundrum which you're suggesting is, is uh, simply that the disease takes a, a time to get going. But that's, again, not the whole answer for sure. 
So you mentioned the uh, GWAS, the genome-wide association studies, and uh, using the, the, the several GWAS studies that have been done on Alzheimer's disease, there are now uh, six, uh, maybe 12 uh, genes which are thought to contribute uh, to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease. And if we do more studies and uh, with larger populations, we'll find even more? Yeah, undoubtedly. How, how many do you think? Well, actually, we'll find, an, uh, an, you know, of actually, what's happening is that uh, if you could, desi you, you simply find more genes the more samples you have, statistically. But I as, you, as you increase your sample size, the, the actual effect size of your genes gets smaller. So APOE, for example, as you mentioned, when we do a, a GWAS, we see that with, with 500 cases. Of course, Alan Roses had found it already, but we see it in the GWAS when with 500 cases. Clustering, CR1, we find with 2,000 cases. BIN1, PCALM, these we find with 4,000 cases. Now we're up to about 30,000 cases, and actually we found about 25 genes now in total. Now, each of these new genes has a tiny effect on risk, tiny effect on risk. And it isn't that they're important, it's their risk effect is not clinically useful. Their risk effect is not really clinically useful. What is useful is it maps a pathway. And you mentioned, started by asking me about APOE. APOE was a mystery. We knew it was, it, obviously, it's a cholesterol involved, but now we have about seven or eight genes which we also know are involved with cholesterol, which are risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So this allows us to start to pull, put together, if you like, a cholesterol jigsaw for Alzheimer's disease. And this might help us start to think about how we should manipulate brain cholesterol with respect to Alzheimer's disease. So that's its utility. It's giving, it's filling in a jigsaw around cholesterol. But uh, APOE is involved also in other processes, in inflammation, and there are other genes yes. which are associated with inflammation sure. as well, with regeneration, uh, and uh, yeah. so uh, the story is complex. Oh, very so, complex. So, but yes. but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that to hear that you uh, want, that you have stressed in your talk the issue of pathways and uh, and the identification of genes in which are involved in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease really is important not in terms of finding therapies which are directed at the genes themselves exactly. but at the mechanisms which underlie the progression of the disease which are uh, triggered by these mutations or polymorphisms. That's exactly what I think. I think that we start to, so for it, we've talked about cholesterol, the other pathways that clearly come up are, are the inflammation pathways and you know we've just identified a gene TREM2. It isn't necessarily that therapies need to be aimed at TREM2. They should be aimed at the process of or at the inflammatory process of which TREM2 is a component. I absolutely agree. So with this uh, developing story uh, do you see the end uh, of the importance of of identifying new genes in neurodegenerative diseases? I'll give you a trivial answer. I'm 59 years old. I'll retire when I'm 66, so let's have seven more years. <laughs> That's the first part of my answer. Do I see a, a, an end to it? Actually, we will, um, we've just started doing a process called exome sequencing, uh, and that will identify a, a new category of genes, and I think we will see in the next, especially because the you, the NIH initiative is really funding an enormous amount of sequencing of Alzheimer cases. I think in the next two or three years, we'll see a bumper harvest of new genes involved in Alzheimer's disease. But do I see an end of this process? Yes, uh, yes, I do see an end of this of this process. What will check? What will come? is that uh, clinicians will sort of start to, uh, I hope anyway, um, know the genetic background of their patients, and maybe that genetic background will guide them towards specific therapies, 
one can imagine a, a, a time in the future where uh, understanding the genetic makeup of somebody at risk of Alzheimer's disease will guide their therapy. And it won't be that we're trying to find new genes. It will be trying to, that we will be trying to use those genes to, 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 to factor our patients into different groups. So, after the end of genetics, will it be the age of epigenetics? What, what's about epigenetics and uh, neurodegenerative diseases? My, we have not worked on epigenetics. And, uh, and epigenetics, uh, epigenetics really, it, just, just to explain to the audience, epigenetics is where uh, DNA methylation and other, other um, factors, not just DNA methylation, but that's the major one, uh, alter the structure of DNA in a, in a, in, in a long-term, though not permanent way, and alter what genes those particular cells express. Undoubtedly, epigenetic mechanisms, in other words, the control of, of, of gene expression, must be important in Alzheimer's disease. Most studies, though, which work on epigenetics, in my view, and this is why we have not done it, are deeply flawed because they take blood samples and look at uh, chain epigenetic mechanisms in blood samples. Whereas, of course, what we're interested in is epigenetic mechanisms in specific cells in the central nervous system. And I've never been convinced that taking blood samples and looking at them for epigenetic changes in Alzheimer's disease was a valuable experimental approach. So we have not done it. That isn't to say that it isn't important and other people disagree with my criticism, but that's my, been my view. John, thank you very much. This has been a real months. pleasure, Amos, a real pleasure. Well, it was uh, very interesting. I learned uh, a lot and uh, thank you very much. And we hope that uh, you will uh, be, uh, we, you, we hope that you will achieve even more before you, the age of retirement, <laughs> and that when uh, the age of retirement will come, you will not stop working, um, and uh, definitely that you will come again to visit us in Israel. I, this is my third trip in the last six months, and I've enjoyed everyone. I have yet to see the Negev Desert. I want to come uh, back definitely and go down to Negev and the south of Israel. Which is half of the country. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much.